and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Come coming to us from coming to us from the city of supposed brotherly love. <laughs> at least what at least that's what I hear. And developer, uh, a man with twenty years of experience with RPG Maker, and the developer of the upcoming Fallen Feather. The one and only <laughs> uh, Rod Roderick Kelly. Yes, yes. Better known as Conflict. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming into the temple and braving the hell of time zones. <laughs> uh, I had to jump at the chance. Mm -hmm. oh. At the very least, a lot a lot of people that I have on are in Eastern Time. I'm I'm the one stuck in Central. Yeah, yeah. When you said the time difference, I was like, oh, wow. Wow. This man is uh, dedicated. Well, some someone has to be, so it bet it better be the guy who runs the place. <laughs> For us to live by. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to I'd like to start at the humble beginnings. Now you've done a, you've got a lot of experience with RPG Maker. How did you How did you first come across it? Was it through what, Was it through any of the console versions, or was it strictly through the PC version of it? So my very, very first brush with RPG Maker um, came from a random game that was basically just called Goku Jr. I'm a huge Dragon Ball fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in the early 90s, uh, when downloading a 20 MP file was a three-hour job, <laughs> there was those little games that you could find and I saw it so I was like oh what's this so I downloaded it I played it and it was terrible it made no sense but I played it for the whole day and I don't know why but I always remembered it and I did see a blurb line on it that said made by RPG Maker mm -hmm. and years later um I was playing Final Fantasy 12 it had just come out and I said, I want to make an RPG one day because I was just so enthralled with it. And I Googled how to make an RPG and the term RPG Maker literally came up. Um, this was 2003, so it was RPG Maker 2003. And I was like, how oddly convenient that they have an RPG Maker. And I was like, I remember this. I remember this whole thing. So I went, downloaded it. And uh, started beginning my journey. Mm -hmm. Now, taking that taking that into account, you mentioned be, you mentioned being a D, you mentioned being a DBZ fan. Did you um did you start out with just Dragon Ball, or did you or did you start out straight out straight into DBZ and pro and probably have to suffer probably suffer through the Boo Saga? So funny slide note. I am one of those weird ones who actually love the Bo Saga. And I, I understand everybody's plight with it. Um, but yes, I first saw Dragon Ball when I vid visited my aunt in Canada. And it was literally just on the TV. And I was like, why is the cartoon so detailed? They have five fingers. And... You know, the intro came on, Rock the Dragon, and I was just like, oh, this is this is fire. Mm -hmm. And I came back home a few weeks later, and Tsunami had just announced itself, and it showed Dragon Ball. I was like, that's that cartoon I watched. Mm -hmm. And I was just 100% enamored with it. Yeah. Um, I'd, because it's me, I'd be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't point out that I've... I've dipped into the tabletop RPG ver version of um, version of Dragon Ball Z, though I don't recommend anyone do it. It kind of it wasn't very good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and 
I had played I had played around with the card game back then. It's um it got a little bit cluttery with time. I believe I saw the cards. I never knew how to play it. I knew how to play it, but the but they added a but they added a few peripherals that you need that you needed, including that little plastic scouter thing for the card. <laughs> wow. Oh. I pre- I prefer a car- I prefer a card game unless it- unless it's a hybrid card and dice thing, um, to stick to using cards exclusively. I'm a bit of a purist that way, but I do find some of the other entries on the inspiration wall to be ki- to be kind of in- to be pretty interesting. Some of them I ca- some of them I expected. Other others um. I'd be cu- I'd be curious as to what as to what exactly provided that bit of inspiration and how that's being used within Fallen Feather. Um, sure. And since we brought it up, I'll start I'll start with DBZ. Sure. So basically, uh, I'm sorry. Did I let you finish the thought, or no? That no. You my thought was already finished. Okay, <laughs> just want to make sure. So, um, Dragon Ball, like I said, is that anime for me. Like, if anybody asks me what my tops are, I'll give you my top five, but there's always a special honor for Dragon Ball at the top. I'm not uh, delusional about the, the story writing and the crazy plots and the holes in them, but that is a series that I know like the back of my hand. So, naturally... When I started structuring Fallen Feather, I took a lot of those character personalities to define my certain characters. And um, not to jump ahead of myself, but um, a lot of the characters in Fallen Feather are directly inspired by a character in either Dragon Ball, the original, or Dragon Ball Z. And my literal... Uh, thought process was what would a story look like if Kid Goku was in a world like Final Fantasy 7, the other major um, inspiration on that wall, Mm -hmm. dealing with a Sephiroth type character. So my original thought was a Kid Goku type character dealing with a Sephiroth type character. A big dreamer, a big adventurer versus a a quintessential god who looks at peons in a different way. You could kind of say that's Frieza as well, but that was my main mindset. Um, there's certainly god complexes with both Frieza and Sephiroth, but it's in different forms. Yes. Um, it's one... One of the one of them it one of them is is a um one of them is a hierophant to their deity and the other one is an emperor. Yes, correct. Um, of course, of course, the deity in question in the in this is obviously Genova. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it did it did amuse me when i think nomura or somebody or somebody else had st- had stated that one of the big inspirations for the design of cloud and sephiroth in 7 is the story of musashi and kojiro yes um which if you vi- if you visualize something like the buster sword as as a gi- as a giant ore that's just that's just been sanded down well then it certainly makes sense because well, a lot of people associate Musashi with with two katanas. In a lot of his duels, he used an oar as a, um, well, a troll move, basically. <laughs> there, even even with even though he's known even though he's known as one of the greatest duelists in Jap- in Japanese history, there were a lot of things that he would do j- to to mess with his opponents, such as showing up late or showing up drunk or using an oar instead of a katana. Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. Yes, yes. Um, but speaking of speaking of that, that brings me to the other avenue with um, Final Fantasy VII, which is interesting because 
there's significantly different tech levels from what I've seen of Fallen Feather and the tech level that was present in in um, FF7. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, with that, I tried... When I first um, started world building, uh, in the same sense where I used Dragon Ball as a influence for the characters, I tried not to make it a direct copy and paste. I, I respect a author's work and just take small cues. Like um, with Goku, Kid Goku, he used to carry the power pole. And um, Zorian uses the staff, but I was like, this staff's not going to have a magical property itself. But he has a special skill of his own that he uses the staff with mm -hmm. um, in that regard. On the same level with Final Fantasy VII, I said, I want the world to have tech, but I don't want it to be too uh, futuristic steampunk, but they do have something of their own level of steam technology. So a uh, point in era that I'm really a fan of is uh, that Victorian era, medieval times-ish. I just took that mm -hmm. little bit of steam tech, and I said, you know what? I love picturesque worlds like uh, Venice. And I know Midgar was like a place I was dripping with live stream pumping through it and stuff like that. So I kind of took that, that cue of live stream and was like, you know what? A water city. Mm -hmm. um, that way it's not too in your face. Hey, this is a uh, pseudo Midgar mm -hmm. and or Midgar, but uh, making it all its own. But one major connection I will say Episode one of Fallen Feather, you are only in that water city in the same regards of if Final Fantasy VII, the first half of disc one, you're only in Midgar. Mm -hmm. So that's one major like uh, correlation. Mm -hmm. And in the, I get the feeling that if you if you I get the feeling you'd probably get a kick out of the tech level present in the Thief games. Uh, Thief Gates, I'm not familiar. The um, Thief. Um, the Dark Project and the Metal Age. Okay. Okay. Which, those were the brainchild of Looking Glass who pioneered the idea of immersive sims, and some of them would go on to, to, um, to form, to form Irrational Games. These makers, the makers of Bioshock. But, Thief wasn't necessarily steampunk. It was a it was a a fantasy esque setting that ha that happened to have some level of some levels of electricity, usually sent usually centered around a faction called the Hammerites. So sorry, you're chipping out a bit. Oh, um, saying that the that um thief isn't thief has electricity, but it it is. Leaning more into a into a fantasy city. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the best way for me to put it. But then we get to the small. Then we get to the semi smaller um, inspirations. And the first one that I saw was um, Star Ocean Second Evolution. Which a question that I have for you on that is: Did you first get introduced to Star Ocean through? The second story on the P on the PS One, or was it through the PSP ports? PS One, a hundred percent. Star Ocean, uh, the second story is um, near and dear to my heart. It's actually one of my favorite uh, RPG of that era, and I just remember it was such a jarring change to me because I played it after Final Fantasy Seven. And it was one of those games where I turned it on and I was like, oh, I'm not going to like this. But the story quickly grabs me and um, I did end up beating it. And it was so near and dear to me when the PSP version came out. I think that's why I even bought a PSP. It was that and um, Crisis Core. So I was like, oh, I got to get a PSP. And I did First Departure for the first time mm -hmm. on the PSP. And then I replayed um, Second Evolution, the port. Uh, so I actually beat Star Ocean twice. Yeah. One, one as Claude and one as uh, I think her name was Arya. I can't Raina. remember her name. Reina. Um, and 
I do find it interesting that you put dot hack gu on on the list. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I could, I I could hope... say that the obvious thing is having a character wielding a scythe, but <laughs> it does fit within that coming of age theme that you mentioned earlier. Yes, yes, very much so. Um, I am a big fan of the Dog Hack series. Um, there's not too many similarities besides the fact that when I started the game, the scope of it was very large, and it was originally going to be one game, but Dog Hack is the one where I looked to, I said, okay, I can make this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously I had played it already, um, but... I was like, an episodic series is actually very enthralling, and I know it is because I very much so love the Dot Hack series and the Telltale series, um, as long as the episodes are not too far spread out. Mm -hmm. But also, when it comes to Dot Hack, um, I was very enthralled with the, 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 the storyline. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember... When the game came out, there was a, a, a story, and it wasn't in-game, but it was that the game was inspired by the Epitaph of the Twilight mm -hmm. um, story, and that was something that was written on a GeoCities, way, GeoCities website way back in the day. And the author or creators from S Cyber Connect 2 were so enthralled with it, they tried to copy... Um, it would have a Twilight and save it, but the website blocked <laughs> right clicking, so they literally wrote down line by line <laughs> the poem, and I thought that was so interesting. Oh, I just had to mention that that was such yeah. an amazing thing to me that as creators they cared so much about preserving that poem because the creator of Episode of the Twilight passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a creator of a game. I was very um, inspired by the fact that other creators could find inspiration and take it to be what what it is today. So um, yeah, it, it's a small it's a small connection, but I I do I do feel inspiration from that hack. Mm -hmm. um, one one interesting <clears throat> item on the inspiration wall was for me was Comic Zone, which. Is considered is considered one is considered one of the big last hurrahs of the Genesis slash Mega Drive for our friends across the pond. Mm hmm. So funny. I'm gonna admit this. I'm gonna admit this right here. I have never played Comic Zone personally, but when I created uh, the project, I wanted to have something unique to it. And at first, I started with a storybook kind of design. But I've always loved manga and comic books. And I would try to find ways to give the battle system more of a comic book feel. And <laughs> you guys see where it is today, but <laughs> trust me, when it was in the beginning, those first that, that first year or two was looking really bad. But I would Google constantly, like comic book style video games and I get like a lot of Spider-Man and stuff like that but one day I came across Comic Zone and I was like whoa and then I went on YouTube I watched videos I went through like a lot of their screenshots and honestly I'm gonna say 70% of how the game looks aesthetically is inspired by Comic Zone and to defend myself I went on Steam and purchased it for three ninety nine, <laughs> but I have not got a chance to actually play it because I want to just sit in there <laughs> and really dive into the world. But yes, that that is a huge inspiration for the aesthetic theme, the comic book style of the game. Mm -hmm. And now, when it comes to these, when it comes to the smaller entries, there is some familiar there are some familiar names and some interesting names. Um, mm -hmm. I do find it interesting that you listed what I personally consider the best Breath of Fire. I know some people swear by three, but it's a free country and they are free to be wrong. Four, ha I feel, had a much bigger impact. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm on. T- I, I, if I was right there, I would shake your hand. Mm-hmm. I think four is by far the best. Now, out of all my inspirations, I think this one is a little bit the most on the nose. When RPG Maker 2K3 was out, there was a lot of sprite rips. So <laughs> when I was 13-year-old me, and I thought of the very, very first bare bones fallen feather, and uh, if I could give you a quick story with that, mm-hmm. I, I mentioned earlier that I even started the whole project of using RPG Maker because I loved Final Fantasy 12, and I in my 13-year-old mind, I thought, if I'm going to make an RPG, the only way it's going to be successful is if the initials are FF. <laughs> so I was like, the initials have to, the game has to have a title with FF. And in my infant mind of a tender age of 13, Ball and Feather came to me. And I was like, this is it. This is going to be the name. And the title has never changed since I was 13 years old. But back on RPG 2K3, spriters weren't a thing like that and a lot of the games were fan games and they used sprite sheets the sprite sheets i chose were a breath of fires i love the isometric look i had played the game in fact i still have an emulator on my phone right now with breath of fire 4 but <laughs> if i were to say it was a a tv show zorian was played by ryu back then Atanu was played by Faulu, and another character who you guys haven't seen yet, but backers have. Uh, her name is Iris. She is inspired by um, Nina. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at their designs side to side, especially Atanu, you can see the the uh, the the fashion and clothes are very similar to Breath of Fire Four, because um, Faulu and Atanu are like. They're purple guys. They're just, they're purple guys. <laughs> and Zorian's hair and um, slender look is all Ryu. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, when it comes to, when it comes, one of the other, um, one of the other ones that I find interesting on the inspiration wall is um, Hunter Hunter. Uh, so Hunter Hunter to go back to the anime, my when I spoke about my favorite animes, mm-hmm. Dragon Ball gets the special mention, but Hunter Hunter is in constant battle with One Piece for the number one spot. I very much so love Hunter Hunter, and Gone is such a compelling character to me, and the writing and world building for Hunter Hunter are present in Fallen Feather. It's kind of hard to describe in what ways, but I do follow a um, an anime reviewer known as Top Totally Not Mark on YouTube, and he gave a amazing review on the entire Hunter Hunter series, and I use that to help me find cues that the author used and to um, what's the word exposition. To use exposition Hunter Hunter, I take a lot of the exposition cues in Hunter Hunter to help define the world of Fallen Feather. There's like certain ways to present scenes and present a character that I love how Hunter Hunter went about it that I try to do with Fallen Feather. Um, because a lot of people say if you look at how Gone was presented, you could see from chapter one of the manga. That he had borderline, I'm going to say, not psychotic, but um, intense personality that you can see from manga chapter one that makes perfect sense to lead up to where he was with Neferpito. And things like that are really impressive to me. And I want to lay a lot of foundation for Zorian now that's going to be present for the end game. Yeah. Oh. Um. And speak, speaking of that, when it came to some, there are some character, there's some writers who end up creating characters and then build a world around them, and then there are some who take the opposite approach. 
you know, and neither mm -hmm. one is better or worse. It's a chicken and egg situation. Mm -hmm. Which did you fall into that into that paradigm? Did you end up creating creating a couple of characters and then build a world around them, or was it the other way around? Um, in its infancy, a hundred percent, I built the characters first, um, and made a story around them, and. When I, I'm gonna put this, thirteen year old me made a story with Zorian, Atanu, and Nina. Um, it was very bare bones. And when I dropped it, I came back to it when I was eighteen. When I was eighteen, I was much more about the world. I built a lot of a bigger world, and I actually started with a prequel story that I typed up on like um, WordPad. And uh, it got it got some good reviews, you know, from randos online. And uh, I dropped the project again until I was 28. So that's 10 years forward. And then I took large chunks of the world building when I was 18 and started to really define the characters now that I had come up with when I was 13. Uh, but short answer, I started with the characters. But when I did begin world building, I went completely... Um, all in on the world building, and then fill that world up with the characters. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the, when it comes to that world, the what I noticed that you went with this idea of two two dis two disasters that are almost almost put the world in a post apocalyptic state, despite despite how the world the technology level might not appear as such given what people think about about um post apocalyptic storytelling mm -hmm. um what gave you the impetus to go down that to go down that route with the world oh um that's actually a really good question um i've been at this project for so long <laughs> sometimes some of the ideas feel like they've been there forever um so I can firmly say when I was rewriting the world, um, this is when I was 28 and I picked up the project um, for, the, for, for what we're seeing today. I knew there had to be at least one catastrophe. Mm -hmm. But I also knew I wanted to deal with um, diversity and things like that. So I had... Reaper's Kiss first, which was originally called Nocte Solis, um, which kind of means in the night, mm -hmm. which is where the event took place. And I couldn't tell you right now what made me think of having the world unable to give birth, but I do remember I wanted something bigger than just, here's this thing, and... Um, it's causing a lot of death. I was like, what is what is something that's truly jarring, truly different? And I and it kind of came to me like a a quote. I was like, the only thing more scary than death is the absence of new life. Um, and honestly, maybe if you Google it, somebody else said it, and I just thought it was me, who knows? <laughs> but I decided, you know what, let's have a world where no children are being born and people are terrified of what's to come. Now Reaper's Kiss itself is, once again, a Final Fantasy VII reference. It's a lot like Meteor towards uh, this three, that it was just constantly in the sky. And people had to continue living their life, but it was like, there's a giant meteor in the sky. What the hell is that? Um, now, to get on a little bit of a more serious note, I did want to include diversity. I did want to include races. And... Um, at my household, we are very um, pro-active in equality and doing our part in being part of a community. And I started to write small blurbs of racial injustice, but it was 2020 and the George Floyd uh, protests that when we were all in quarantine, I was just so taken aback by all of it. I said, you know what? This is something that I've never had to live through because I was born in the 90s. I didn't have to deal with, you know, civil rights movements like that before. This is a big time. 
I watched hundreds of videos and a few of them really, really, really hit me in a way that I never knew I could be so emotionally invested in that kind of way. I went and protested myself and um, I came home and I was like, it wouldn't be right for me to put little fictional blurbs of racial injustice and not do it properly. So I rewrote almost a large part of the story and was like, this racial justice has always existed in Fallen Feather. And the crisis of lack of new life has only made things worse because people are scared of what the future may hold. People don't know who to point fingers at and people's true colors are starting to show. And on top of that, um, they've always had a history, but they've tried to make it look like it's not that bad. But when people's backs are really against the wall, you start to see how people really treat each other. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like how that came about. Now, when it comes to the systems that you that we have with the um, with the UI and 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 beyond that, um, mm -hmm. there is a there is a few things that I'm curious where where your head where your head was at. First of which is the whole flow of battle thing and and the fact that you referenced Final Fantasy X, Octopath Traveler, and the Atelier series. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of those games, the the turn they're they're all still turn based, but the turn order is dependent on your choice of actions. Mm -hmm. And same thing go, same thing goes with en with enemies. It's constantly shifting. Do you plan on having a similar motif with the flow of battle in Fallen Feather? Hundred percent. Um, there's no deep uh, thinking there for me. It's just. I've enjoyed that type of turn-based battle the most. I think traditional is very just, okay, I'm going to hit you. Okay, now you're going to hit me. Wow. Um, they call those conditional turn-based battles. Uh, I feel like I'm more invested in the in the look of and the, the strategy of it. And you're constantly going, okay, I'm going to use this potion and help out my guy over here. But crap, now the enemy is going to get two attacks i don't know if i can stand that mm -hmm. maybe i should do this so um some people say it's a speed game and if you just really pour um into the character speed uh it's an instant win so i made sure to put caveats that if you use this item it has a certain weight to it if you use this attack it has a certain weight to it and you really have to think okay what is the best course of action to get me to beat this opponent? Yeah. Now, that brings me to feathers, which you do, which you do say are analogous to materia, which brings in a couple, um, a couple, a couple of questions for me because one major critique that I always had with the materia system, with the mm -hmm. so, with the sole exception of materia, you. Use in Dirge of Cerberus, which doesn't count. It was just, it was just a different type of blasting, and yeah. um cr and Crisis Core because it didn't have this problem, mostly because you couldn't get away with it since you're only playing one person the entire game. Is characters becoming vessels for materia more th more than more than anything else? I e I e oh, that there's no way I e that there's less of a way for individual characters to express themselves outside of what they get from uh, materia and I'm curious if this is so if this is something you plan to you plan to address and it looks like in so on some levels you are with some of the other options available uh yeah I would definitely um say <laughs> I'm, I'm an honest person I would definitely say that um aspect of it is probably going to still be prevalent. And um, even with us talking about it now, I can also look at it a bit more. But um, characters will essentially be vessels. I feel like how you put that. In the sense that um, wishes, which is uh, the one green-eyed race and Zorian, mm -hmm. and omens, the orange-eyed race, including Atanu, they 
have certain fallen feathers that only wishes can use and certain fallen feathers only omens can use. And there are obstacles in the game where you have to have certain fallen feathers equipped to get across. Kind of like the HM skills in Pokemon. And um, so, for example, uh, if you was watching the trailer, there's a, uh, a lock on a, a security wall. And Zorian uh, is, gives you the prompt to use the spark feather to kind of overcharge the, uh, the security panel. That spark feather actually belongs to Atanuka. But, you know, as the party, you get to use whoever's magic is equipped. And if Atanuka didn't have that spark feather equipped, he wouldn't be able to um, overcharge the security panel. Uh, so in that right, yes, they kind of are vessels for what magic is available and you have to um kind of think what is best for the area that you are in at current but i'm planning to make sure it's kind of obvious like if you're in this area or this dungeon uh fire might be king so just make sure one of the wishes have fire on them uh while the other characters can use whatever um Another caveat is uh, the, these characters have another ability I don't talk about much, but they have a in-lore ability known as talents, which are very similar to, um, uh, I guess you could say the abilities on X-Men, like, like, like one special ability. And that's more tied to their limit break style skill, mm -hmm. but even if your main character, you give him just certain magic to get through this level, he has his own use. Like, Atana was a uh, basically your badass white mage. His talent is a healing ability. So... Would you say he's you more of a white mage or a paladin? You know what? That's that's very fair. A paladin. A paladin. Um, so Yeah, so he's not 100% your Aerith, but he's not 100% your... Um, Cecil. Thank you. Thank you. Uh oh. And to be f to be fair, I don't think I don't think you I don't think the feather system um, is gon is going to fall into the same trap as the as the vessel thing with materia for a couple reasons. One, the slots are the slots are not. De it seems like the slots are not determined by equipment. No matter whether you're equipping early game stuff or late game stuff, there's always a rule of four. If I'm reading this correctly. Yes. Yes. And two, when it comes to the things that you can, when it comes to the things that you can do, the sandbox, as I, as I call it, your it isn't every all roads do not lead to materia. Yes. Yes. Those are two, and as if I'm being if I'm being honest, the the whole certain materia can only be equipped by by certain rate by certain races. What I'm kind of reminded of is the difference between the way pins worked in the original The World Ends With You and Neo. Oh, oh. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar... Are you familiar at all with The World Ends With You? Yes, very much so. Is in, the f in the first game, since you were mostly control... Since 90% of the time you were controlling Neku, um, any pin was on the table. Because Neo is a par because Neo is more about controlling a party. Each party member has cer has certain pins that they're going to gravitate to. It is. That's... Go ahead. No, 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 no. I was uh, I was mulling it over in my head. You're actually right. I didn't play um the full game of the new version, but I did play the demo, mm -hmm. and uh, the demo is actually quite lengthy and. You get at least three characters, and I was thinking about what you were just saying. Like, it's true. Each one had, like, certain pins that made sense for them. Yeah. Um, a lot of, a lot of the charge base and, and, hev and heavier pins I had, I had always give to Minami Moto, which I'm glad to, I'm glad to see he was back. I'm glad to see he was back. <laughs> just because <laughs> that, ma that man is absolutely nuts, and I love it. Um, <laughs> But the other thing that the 
the of course the other thing that I um that I had note that I had noticed throughout was the was the use of was the use of soul power and vi and vibes, which I think is yes. another thing that's going to distinguish. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, I can say, while they have been there for quite a while, they have just recently gotten their titles mm -hmm. <laughs> of soul power and vibe. Um, I'll, I I just forgot. I think I was literally calling it the limit break gate before. Um, but yes, um. I am very excited about that system in the sense that I was trying to find a system that I could work with RPG Maker as well as something that made sense in lore. Because my end game is I do eventually want actually really my and my end game is I really want Fallen Feather to one day become an anime. Um but I also want it to become a manga. And I I'm very meticulous about making sure the game makes perfect sense so that when I get to those adaptions, everything feels seamless. And I took a lot of cues from um, Naruto's chakra system and Dragon Ball's Kai system or key system. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, as, as you probably read, soul power is basically soul energy that they can harness to use uh, the special abilities that they use in the game. And when they're vibing, it's just kind of like when you, you know, it's like real life. When you work on something and you kind of get in your zone and your focus and everything just makes sense. That's basically what vibing is. And that's when you use the character's full potential. You'll have um, talents available, which is the, basically the limit breaks. And you can use stronger skills because the characters are more... Um, um, spiritually charging their their attack moves, so I thought that was a really cool way to um, put it back there. Um, being in the same sense of when an artist puts on their headphones and goes crazy on a canvas, and like everything makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, with the with that with that in with that in mind, something something else I. Was a I was a bit cur I was a bit curious about is um is what is an issue that an issue that a lot of a lot a lot of um get a lot of a lot of RPGs have had is the skewedness with um status effects and as much as I love the Mega Ten series I'm looking squarely at you with this. Yes, <laughs> not so not so much the Persona games, but the mainline Mega Ten games um, have ha have XCOM levels of bullshit when it comes to the when it comes to the RNG regard regarding status effects and just RNG okay. just RNG in general. I remember I remember um, for be feeling like it was extremely skewed where enemies were getting crits more often than I was. Okay, but there's but throughout throughout my early years there was the stereotype of don't waste your time with stat with status effects because you'll never hit them. Um, mm -hmm. Have you taken steps to make sure that that doesn't happen? That um, de that debuffs can be just can be just as useful for players as they potentially can be with enemies. Um. Yes, I actually am working towards that. I. Feel like I've spent more time than I've wanted to <laughs> on status effects, and I can happily say, episode one only deals with um, two status effects, which is um, very similar ones: poison and what I call bleeding, um, which is basically just um, dot. Yes, and. Um, Atanu's main talent skill is a regen base, so that's it literally cancels the other one out. But I try to make sure for every status ailment there is a buff or debuff that counteracts it and that they are fair on both spectrums. Um in fact, one I think it is oh, there's another main status effect, which is actually more towards the player's use. Um 
at current is called injure and what that does is it's uh going back to the whole conditional turn base battle system mm -hmm. when you're finding an opponent and you vibe your attack um has a condition where it can cause the enemy to be injured when they're injured their speed is cut so if you're dealing with a character who or an opponent that's wildly faster than you and getting three turns or two turns for every one of yours uh hitting that injure um status effect actually brings them down to your level and now it's either you're getting two turns on them or it's one one mm -hmm. and <laughs> i can say at the current build of the game Injured is cranked all the way up because I'm the developer, so I play on easy mode. <laughs> but I will definitely make sure that is um, something that you actually hit it. It's actually useful, but it's not overly done. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it'll be something that you can hit at least at least over forty percent of the time. Yeah, and when it comes, I'm just gl I'm just glad that I d that there's a cons that with that status effect list, there's a conspicuous lack of confused because. Since you lit, since you listed at least one generation of Pokemon, you're probably familiar with why everyone hates Zubats and why everyone really hates Marlboros. <laughs> yes, I am. I am, and I, I, I do hate Z Zubats. Marlboros, I'm okay with, but I, I, I hate. I well, always hate Zubats. Marlboros, you have to go out of your way to to fi to find, and I only I only really hated them the most in eight. Because bad, because they would use bad breath right out of the gate, and mm. I, and I needed Marlboro tentacles for certain for certain things, especially since Doom Train is a godsend midway through eight. <laughs> yes, yes. But Zubats, with with the exception of one generation, anytime you're in a cave, you're gonna be dealing with Zubats. And that's why I hate Zubats. I have, uh, e even as you said it, I got triggered a bit. <laughs> um, I constantly remember, I, I think it was Pokemon Yellow, Red, and Blue, uh, that one came of Zubat Central. And back then, we were in our novice years of RPG games, obviously. So I was just in that cave like, Mommy, wh wh I need help. <laughs> I need an adult. There's a, there's a concept I refer I refer to as difficulty spiking, which yes, ideally the ideally there's supposed to be a steady difficulty curve, but spiking is when it just goes right up. <clears throat> yeah, and well, a good a good Pokemon example of that is the is the second gym leader in Gen two, who to be fair, um. Molly, the and I'm, I know I'm missing. I know I'm miss. I know I'm, that's the wrong name, but I keep thinking it's Daisy, and it's not. She's seriously. She looks like Daisy from Mario. Um, <laughs> she she utilizes a, a lot of normal types. She's not that hard if you know that she's coming, but if you do, but that but foreknowledge doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes to the discussion of difficulty spiking, and. That mill tank was the stuff of nightmares for me as a kid. <laughs> yes, yes, agreed. You think that you think that you're finally co coming out on top, and then rollout happens, and your shit gets wrecked. Oh man! Oh. I never played the oh, remake, memories. so I don't know if they fixed it there, but I kind of doubt it. I I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know the remakes, but. If, as far as far as Zubat's triggering you, well, welcome to my world. Anytime geese are brought up, <laughs> oh wow! Because I immediately think of Ge I immediately think of Geese Howard, and then I think of all all of those quarters I lost with er, with early, um, ar with early art of fighting as well. Mm, mm. <laughs> everybody talk. Yes, everybody knows about SNK boss syndrome. Art of Fighting was SNK boss syndrome on every stage. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but we had now you had you had mentioned one half of the equation being being analogous to a um 
um, Zorian being analogous to a paladin. Um, with a ta with a Tanu, would if we're going by that route, would he be analogous to a Dark Knight? Um. Yeah. Yeah. See, I could definitely say Atano is a Dark Knight. He's um. He's the strong, quiet uh type with the uh with the noble heart. Um, you could definitely get to be super Dark Knight literal. Uh, Bruce Wayne vibes. Uh, his strong moral compass, as I, as I said before, with the Dragon Ball characters, Atanu is Piccolo. He is no nonsense with the heart of gold. Mm -hmm. um, definitely Dark Knight. Well, if I want to be pedantic, I could say Piccolo Jr., but point still stands. <laughs> <laughs> it still stands. Yeah. Um. And I. And I'm guess I'm guessing I'm guessing that a lot of a lot of the more debilitating. Um, feather, feather effects would be would be the ones that he that he'd be easier to equip with. Uh yes. Uh for one reason or another, um, I didn't really design it that way. But omens do have more of the status effect um attached skills, while wishes have more of the um your traditional element skills that 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 you're you're familiar with, like. I try to make it fair on both sides, but yes, omens do have access to more status effect enabling uh, abilities. Mm -hmm. Now, I now with all that with all that in mind, I I know that you had um, you've set you set up a a page on itch. Mm -hmm. um, are you pl are you planning on are you planning on put putting a wish list page on Steam down the road? Yes, yes. Steam is definitely in the works. The, um, truth be told, the only reason there isn't one is because I read the instructions for setting it up, and I was like, I'm not doing all this before my uh, Kickstarter campaign. This is just a lot. So, um, I did plan on doing it before the campaign ended, um, but life is just a lot of things going on, and that Steam page is gonna take at least two weeks before I even get the bare bones set up. Mm -hmm. Which, well, as they say, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. This is true, and I am um um impatiently waiting for my Steam Deck. I am on the quarter three list, and I'm already seeing a list of uh, RPG Maker games that are compatible, and I fantasize about seeing Fallen Feather on the Steam Deck. Mm -hmm. And just just out of curiosity, when I first when, when I saw the grid, you're, I'm probably not the first person to say to bring this up, but I immediately ended up thinking of the uh, the um pocket watch from Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very. You are the first to say it, but you're also the first to notice that. Um, funny enough, when I was talking about the grid uh, with some coworkers and stuff like that, because I have a few friends who are interested, mm -hmm. I said basically grab your smartphone and fuse it. And I don't know if you want to fuse it by taping them together <laughs> with a pocket watch. And that is basically the grid in and of itself. And I did take some cues from Fault from an Alchemist. I did Yeah, you pretty much hit it on the head there. Is this a bad time to mention that one that one of my that one of my favorite one of my favorite characters in in um, literature is Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> Never a bad time. I, I <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Makes you know, sense. Just the little details are always the most important. <laughs> yes, I, I, that actually put quite a smile on my face. I thought not a lot of people would uh, pick up on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the, with all of that with all of that in mind, 
the the demo I, the demo's been available for a bit. What would you say have been some of the big lessons that you learned from the reception to it? Um I am so that's that's a, that's a big question for me. Mm -hmm. I am very blessed and I am learning a lot. And I, I, I guess the best way I can put it is I basically ran out into a field, a uh, minefield, not knowing what I was doing. And I am really impressed I've made it this long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the sense of I knew I had a lofty goal of 5,000 plus. And every time I researched like Kickstarter and things like that, um, they were like, make sure you have your ducks in a row, make sure you have your ducks in a row, make sure you have your following, your fan base and all that, things like that. And I'm like, sure, 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 sure. But then when I really did the campaign, I'm like, oh, wow. I, these, these people that I'm up against, um, they really had their, their ducks in a row. And I'm still very blessed that every day I check the campaign and like there's a new supporter and i'm just like for somebody who has no um fan base like that for them to see the project and be interested enough to put their money towards it and even you reaching out and um being interested in the game like i don't have a an official playable demo out just like the content that i've been sharing and for people to see what i'm doing and respond to it so so uh enthusiastically well, i don't want to say I, I don't care if i hit the kickstarter goal or not of course i do but i have just feel super blessed that i really am making something that people care about mm -hmm. uh, i will i will be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops one way or the other but mm -hmm. with that in mind I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and again breaking braving the hell that is time zones to come all the way out all the all the way up to the mountains where 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 my holy grounds are and enjoying the madness at play here. Right. Not a problem, not a problem. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. <laughs> I can attest to that. I, I like that. I like that. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, this was my very first interview, so I will hold it dearly to my heart. And I do hope to uh, be back on here, uh, hopefully when the project is out in some form or manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, drinking can be celebratory or how, however it may be, but drinking can commence. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>